wanted to restore. There had to be at least one of them. So we had every we had the information we needed for a restoration. And that was, you know, that realization was incredibly comforting at the beginning of a very big project. Now, boy, the biggest issue with this project was figuring out what everything was, because it's industrial goes out. And so it uses fasteners as a part of its decoration. So do you need this many ribbons in a steel column like that to hold together? No, you don't need that many You need maybe one fifth, one tenth as many ribbons as, as, as it. And in fact, what's this? It's obviously cast iron. What are these? Well, they're fake ribbons, right? And then this piece up here, we'll talk about in a moment. But in other words, it was really pretty interesting trying to figure out what everything was. You'd say, okay, well, if I could get a lift. Well, we, we did get a lift. We didn't have access to anything on the water side of the lift. We had to put scaffolding. And one of the issues that we had was that there were so many different materials there. So you had, um, you had cast iron and steel. You had, obviously, this is sheet. Sheet metal. It's sheet copper, right? It's sheet copper. And then you had... <clears throat> The DOT had basically, every time something fell off into the water, they gave the building another coat of paint. They didn't fix it with the phone, but they just gave it another coat of paint. So everything was painted this vertical screen, much in the same way, so it resembled the hobo pattern, which was all sheet copper. But these pieces were, in fact, sheet copper, stamped sheet copper. This is riveted steel plate. This is sheet copper as well. And these are cast iron, made to look like, like riveted steel plate. So we had. Copper, riveted steel plate, cast iron, and on the inside, we actually had zinc and galvanized steel cladding on the inside of the arches where the boats pulled in. Zinc and galvanized steel. So I said, boy, came back to this battery idea, right? I said, you've got all these different metals set into the salty water of New York Harbor. I said, this building is the perfect galvanic cell. I said, if you could just figure out where to put the wires, you could like half a Manhattan with the electricity <laughs> getting off my list. And so at the job interview, at the job interview, I said to the people, I said, you've got these issues here, show them some slides. And I said, so I think you should change the name of the building from the Battery Maritime Building to the Maritime Battery Building. <laughs> and I said, but I know, I'm really bad at puns and things, but we got the job, we got the job anyway. And so, and so I got to work on the building. And the first thing that the, oh, one of the first things we had, everybody in our office, except me, and one other person that graduated from Columbia. And we had, I had a, a very detail-oriented young woman uh, who I said, you're going to, you're going to be in charge of figuring out what everything is on this building and figuring out what needs to be done. And she went, oh, oh, I don't do this. And I said, she said, but how will I tell what everything is? I said, well, we'll do that together. And I'll show you how you can find out what everything is. So one of the issues was is that you had this cast iron. It's clearly cast iron. All right? You can even see the bolt holes, right, where everything is bolted. So that's all cast iron. That's easy to see. But on the water side, you had cast iron here, and you can see the cast iron coming apart because the clips are clipped. So you know that's cast iron, right? You know these, but this is, of course, an applied piece. This is an applied piece, but this is still cast iron. And this is obviously with an angle here, the rivets here. This is, I mean, 10 times as many rivets as they need, but it's, but it's obviously riveted steel plate, steel angle, riveted steel plate. That turns out to be copper. What about this? Why? That's, those are all false for the heads. These are 800 pound, six foot tall pieces of cast iron made to look like wrought iron. It's just amazing, absolutely amazing. So you had steel plate, riveted steel plate, you had cast iron made to look like riveted steel plate, and you had cast iron made to look like wrought iron. You know, it's, it was pretty amazing. And in this particular case, on the, on the street side, Riveted steel plate, cast iron, and fake ribbon heads. 
What the heck are these? Well, it turns out that these are thousand pound monolithic pieces of cast iron. These large ones, the large ones that support the corners. There's smaller ones back here as well, but these ones are all cast iron. This, of course, is just riveted steel. So figuring out what everything was was sometimes, did I miss one? Um, no, I didn't miss one. But yeah, did I miss that? Did I go past that? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so these are uh, the arches underneath the Guasavino wall of the loja in the front. And this we couldn't quite figure out what it was, but it turns out that it's all riveted steel plate. It just has three different sizes of rivets. And so they actually pierced and cut. I thought that this would clearly be casting or something, but it's not. It's riveted steel plate, but very, very ornamental. And these, it's clearly cast iron, but it's cast iron with false rivet heads made to look like, made to look like, like riveted steel plate. And these, I thought we had these figured out. The big ones were cast iron, entirely cast iron. These are the ones that took all the weight, and they were they they took all the weight because the big ones were only set like every thirty feet. They were there for design purposes. The small ones are the ones that actually supported the thing, and so they were all in the steel because they could take and they could take a an oblique load. They could take a tensile load, and. I figured, okay, they're all, we went up there and scratched around a little bit. We said, okay, they're all riveted steel, riveted steel angles on one plate. And when we got into construction, we found that that was right, except this tiny little round piece here, which had a curvature that was too tight for them to roll, was in fact a casting that had been added to the rest of the assembly. So it didn't take any weight, but it was there for ornament purposes. Okay, so, you know, nothing for the city ever goes very quickly, all right? We were working for the, what's worse, we were working for the DMT uh, via the EDC, Economic Development Corporation. And um, so the first thing, we could do the condition survey of, of the street side from a lift, although we had to get lots of permits for that, but the water side, how do we get up there, right? Well, we had to erect scaffolding. It took 18 months to get permission to erect a scaffold because the building is perched on top of two subway tunnels. The, the two and the three and the R and the N tunnels are directly underneath the building. So we couldn't put weight on anything except portions of the portions of the original building. So it took 18 months to get the scaffolding erect. Anyway, you'll You'll, if you work in New York, you'll get used to this. You'll get used to this. Um, so that young woman, Deirdre, who asked me, how am I going to tell what everything is? I said, okay. All right, Deirdre, if it's steel, it pack rusts, makes a little kind of a phyllo dough of rust, and then just disintegrates, especially on this building, which hasn't been, which hasn't been, mind you, which hasn't been attended to. I said, so you're going to find a lot of deterioration like this that if you look at it carefully, you'll understand what it was. In other cases, you'll have pieces that are obviously so deteriorated that it can't be anything else. If it's steel, it, it, will, it will pack rust and exfoliate like this, all right? If it's cast iron, it won't rust much at all because cast iron has about 5% carbon in it, and those flakes of carbon in the cast iron keep it from rusting. The problem with cast iron, is that it breaks. So if you hit it, you can't find it, put a load on it, it's too high, or you hit it with a hammer, it just cracks like that. So everything, so I said, you're basically, you're, if it's fat rusted, it's steel. If it's cast, if it cracks, broken, it, it's cast iron. All right. Is there a crack on that? Or There's a crack there in the corner, and then the other piece cracked off, and, and there's, you see, that was in oh, fact, that was one piece. You can see a vertical crack there. So that, that corner. And that corner also cracks, that's cracked up. So if it's cracked or broken, it's cast iron. If it's, if it's pack rusted, it's steel. Now, one of the big issues for this building was subsidence. 
because the structure had deteriorated so dramatically, we had areas, especially areas in front of the building, where under columns, the building had subsided two inches. And so we had to find an instructional engineer, one of the one of the basic, their Bible is leave it in place and support it where it is. Don't try to move it back up, right? And so we had to find a way to, to with that substance to accommodate the changes in design or in, in linearity of the of the ornamental pieces as well. And that required not only a lot of head scratching, but a lot of arguments with the contractor. That was pretty amazing. So pieces like this front balustrade were really pretty, were really pretty difficult to deal with and the and the, and the corners and the bases of the columns. And that's what the structure looked like on the water side, especially, but also in the front, there was a massive, two massive beams and they were toast. It was really pretty amazing. So the, the shoring that had to take place for the structural re repairs before anything else could happen was, was pretty daunting. Okay, so our plan was, here's what we're doing. We're gonna remove all the clouds, all of them. We're going to abate thermal spray and paint. Thermal spray is actually, it's a molten metal spray and spray on, on on various substrates and provide zinc or zinc and aluminum to keep this to protect the steel that you're spraying on. You can use it for cast iron, whereas you can't dip cast iron into molten zinc because it'll work, but you can zinc thermal spray. So we wanted to thermal spray or hot dip galvanize and paint. And then we wanted to repair that and reinstall it. Some of the pieces we wouldn't reinstall, we would have to replicate. And that is, these are the the newels that were on the front rail, and those newels had all broken at their bottom mounting studs because of the deterioration of the fasteners. And so, because they had to have adequate lateral strength to support a railing, we we, we had to replace all of them. So basically, they were all broken, but we had to replace all of them. Other pieces, like these anchor medallions on the front rail were so iconic that they seem precious to us. Now, what's the basic premise of cast iron? If you have all the cast iron fabricators will give you a price for the pattern and one-off, meaning the first casting. That's what their basic price is. That might cost you 5,000 bucks. All the other castings might cost you 375 bucks. Okay, so we had the pattern. We were missing three of these anchor medallions. We were, in, we're missing three. So we had to make a pattern for them anyway. Okay? And making all the others would have been cheaper than repairing them because it turns out that all of the others were broken at their mounting stubs from rusting of the fasteners. So I went hat in hand to the client one day and I said, sorry, but I said, I don't want to replace these. I want to repair them and reinstall them because they're too precious. The client, it was, it was a, a wonderful day. The client said, okay, yeah, I know what you're, I know why you want to do that. So go ahead and repair it. So we repaired the mounting stubs on these pieces and we only replaced three, which was great. But the, that's something you should know about cast iron, which is once you've made the pattern, the others are cheap. 250 pages in the documents for exterior restoration, a 50 page schedule of replacement or repair or retention and refinishing for all of the pieces on it. Each piece of steel, each piece of cast iron listed separately. Um, boy, that was a daunting task and yet somehow Deirdre lived through it, right? The cost estimate for this work, which was done in cooperation with the three major cast iron fabricators in the United States, Allen Architectural Metals, Robinson Iron, and Historical Arts and Castings, was 9.5. We didn't do the cost estimate, unfortunately. Tishman, Tishman did the, the cost estimate. But when the bids came in, bids came in three times as high. In part, they said, because if they had undertaken this by themselves, they would have had to basically not take any other work at all for five or six years. And they would have sunk their, their business long-term. And so 
they all basically overbid it because they thought of, they were afraid of it. They were scared of it. And it was. It's the largest cast iron restoration in New York City, certainly. I don't know where there was another one in New York, in, outside of New York, it was as big, but this was a daunting one. So ultimately, what we ended up doing was negotiating it together with all three firms. So all three firms, major cast iron firms, historical action castings, Robinson and Allen Architecture Mills got individual chunks of the project. And it had to be, the documents had to be separated into those different chunks because we needed to do it. Now, ultimately, so what, what was the price? The price came in for the work we did with compromises, came in about 14 to 15 million dollars. So it was something that was reasonably palatable to the client. That plan B was, Remove nearly all the cast iron, not all of it. We left some in sheltered areas. Limit the removals of steel, and I'll tell you what. Uh, selectively thermal spray. Only those areas, obviously, where we were taking the pieces off the cast iron off, would be thermal spray. And then abate and reinstall them. So what we kept was all of these, if you can believe all this, all of these, including these rivets here, these are all large castings. That's all cast iron. This is rivet and steel plate. And these are those copper and tile frames, which were basically in good condition. So in order to save about $5 million, we left all this steel, which allowed us to leave these copper frames and tiles in place. And we took these off and treated them separately, but left the steel in place and then repaired damage to the steel arch behind here in situ. So that saved about $5 million. Bucks. All, of this, this, all of the cast iron and steel underneath the lotion that we left in place. It was blasted to remove all the paint and repaint, but it was not otherwise disassembled. And in fact, it was in good condition. We didn't have failure in these pieces. And that saved about another five million. We didn't do any of the storefronts because they didn't have a, and those have obviously been done now because Cipriani is in the, is in the building. Uh, and we, because we didn't have a occupancy for them. We did do one at the end separately for EDC as a waiting room for the Coast Guard, but the others were not, were not touched, so that saved some money as well. And, much to my chagrin, Jorge will tell you that I'm unreasonable about use of original materials. I like to use original materials, all right? I don't like fire glass, Jorge. <laughs> I don't like fire glass. All right, so... Um, the inside, the arches on the inside um, were done with galvanized steel, cheap, and zinc, stamp zinc. But these pieces here were run on an obscure piece of machinery called an English wheel that allows you to do molding and curving on any curvature. Replicating this, there's one in the United States. Replicating this came into, in, in sheet metal, came in about 4.5 million. Fiberglass came in 1.4 million, 1.2, something like that. And I basically had to just eat it, you know, just shut up. Okay, Piper, shut up. And that's what I did. So, you didn't think you were going to get out of here with learning something about metal, did you? <laughs> okay. Anybody who paints steel from cast iron is going to tell you, any paint fabricator or paint manufacturer is going to tell you, yeah, you need this level of surface preparation to, to use this paint. And all the paints have different levels of surface preparation that they're suitable for. If you want to, and this book is really a pretty amazing book. This is a book that classifies rust into five different levels of rust and then classifies the level of surface preparation for each of the types of surface preparation, the race of surface preparations for the different types of rust. So this is a book, in other words, something like this tells you that this is rust level C, and this is when you do it to an SP7, this is what it looks like, an SP4, an SP10, and an SP5, that's what it should look like. So, there's a guy, we had a guy who worked five months during construction, who did nothing, um, who did nothing but examine the cleaning, the level of cleaning, and the level of rust. And he walked around with this, you see what shape this is, right? 
It's the perfect shape to fit in your rear pocket. You walk around with this in his rear pocket all day, and then he'd whip it out if he needed it, but he pretty much knew what was what everything was. So SP10, near white glass cleaning, was what you have to achieve to do a zinc thermal spray. SP6 is what you can do in situ. And yet when I call up the uh, when I call up call up the guy at 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 Tanini to ask him what primer I should use, he said. What can you give me? Meaning, what level of surface preparation do you mean? When I said an SP6, he said, is it a real SP6? <laughs> so, so that's why we had a guy who did nothing but check level of preparation. So that's what an SP6 looked at. All these pieces were blasted in situ. They have to be blasted in the morning and painted by the nightfall because uh, if they sit overnight, they'll flash rust. So these were, so every all the work that was done each day had to be, had to be scheduled so they could blast for half of the day and then paint for half of the day and have it painted with a couple with coating primer before night foam. What did they blast with? This was wet abrasive cleaning and they had to correct, they had to collect the aggregate because it's lead contaminated, right? And they have to, all the effluent, so all that has to be contaminated, has to be collected and the, uh, and it has to have, because they use wet to keep the dust down, they use a wet abrasive they have to use a special chemical called hold tight that keeps it from rusting immediately as they blast it. And that'll hold it for a period of time until they can paint it. And so it's blasted in sand? Or... Pardon me? It, 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 it's, it's a water and sand mixture? A water and sand mixture, yeah. And, and the chemical? Well, water, it's actually a water and slag mix, but that's yeah, basically a water and abrasive mix. Anything that could come off, how am I doing for time? Got like, it. Like, right. Right. Okay. All right. Anyway, anything that could come off, anything that had to be done, sit to get an SP6 and receive a particular primer. Anything that, that could come off got blasted to an SP10 in a booth like this, right? And then got a zinc thermal spray and 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 then was before it was Reset. Now, the other thing you need to know about cast iron, in addition to that thing that I told you about patterns and one off, is that these pieces look interchangeable. They, all of the bolt holes were done separately for each piece. And so you have to put every piece back with the pieces that it's connected to in its original location. Every piece that came off had a little brass tag on it with a number on it, the number from the documents that was used that stayed with it while it was blasted, while it was thermal spray, and while it was painted, and then until it was reassembled. So um, it's not these aren't interchangeable pieces. They'll, they go where they were, and that's what they and the way you have to do it. So the sink is what used in well, I won't bother you with sink being a note. Yeah, I will bother you. Zinc being a Zinc being a noted to steel and cast iron, but in other words, it deteriorates preferentially to it. And so you can use hot tip galvanizing for steel. You can dip it, but you can't do that with cast iron, like I said, because of warm. So that you have to thermal spray. And I wish I could show you some thermal spray today, but you'll see it if you'll see it uh, perhaps next year if all goes well. So everything that was going on, clips, supports, everything had to get dipped into these 800,000 vats of molten zinc in Perth and Boy, New Jersey. And uh, the halcyon days before COVID, pre-COVID, um, this talk was supposed to be accompanied by a, by a field trip to Venus Hot Dip Gallon. Um, but uh, the administration had other ideas and unfortunately you couldn't do it. But um, if you're around next year, take the, the medals course. I got my fingers crossed. I think we'll probably be able to do it next year. Anyway, it's an interesting field trip. Um, and it's, and there, there's actually a lot to know about hot dip galvanizing. You would think the level of rust that you saw on the front of the building underneath the gutter was such you'd think that these pieces had to be completely replaced. But in fact, most of what you're seeing is pack rust that's much more voluminous than the steel underneath it. And so, the, uh, and so the, the, uh, the pieces like this, when they came off, disassembled often, 
you can see that, well, really, it's only that front angle, that one angle that needs to be replaced, and that was typically the place. The big issue for these was not replacing those angles. It was, it was figuring out how to fasten these together so that you look just like the original riveted pieces. And what we did, see that little rivet up in the corner there? We stick a rivet through the visible portion so that you can see the visible rivet head, and then in the back they would tack weld a little weld in the back to hold the pieces together. So the rivet was basically not riveted the way they were rivet, riveted, but just welded on the rear face where it wasn't visible. And all the clips, everything, everything, but all the exposed fasteners on the cast iron were stainless steel. And people say, well, quite a bit about galvanic deterioration. But in fact, you have a very small amount of stainless steel, a lot of steel and cast iron, Galvanic action is nil. So, but all the clips and things like this that had rusted needed to be needed to be galvanized as well. So everything that was that was made there was was basically was galvanized. Everything we needed to attach to reattach it to steel was galvanized. Oh, disassembly! I can't tell you how many times I said to the contractor, "No, it has to be disassembled." because there's rust in between the individual components. So everything was disassembled. Do I have to say it again? Everything was disassembled. And in fact, that's the only way to make sure that the paint doesn't fail at these, at these small areas of rusting in between pieces, which are not cleaned and not, you know, not accessed unless the pieces are disassembled. So that was, that was one of the most expensive parts of the job. The paint systems, uh, fairly typical for steel, we would use a zinc dust, zinc oxide primer when we could surprise some level of galvanic protection, when we couldn't uh, zinc thermal spray something. And then typically there's an epoxy mid coat and then a urethane top coat that's resistant to UV. And that's what you'll use for steel primer and we used everywhere. We used everywhere with certain modifications and certain instances, which I'll talk more about. I learned a lot about cast iron here. What I learned about cast iron was that the pieces aren't perfect. This blast, these blasted pieces here, the, you would think these, these pieces, these are, are rust painting. It's not. This is in fact air bubbles from the original castings, which were end casts. If a piece is end cast, so it has to be cast on all sides rather than face cast where it sits down in the mold and you can vibrate it, right? Right? The, if it's end cast like this, bubbles get trapped and uh, and and the casting has bubbles in it, but these would originally have been treated with a filler, typically a lead white linseed oil filler before they painted it. And that's pretty much what they do now. When they don't use lead white, they use other fillers to, to fill the bubbles. So there's a lot of inconsistent, a lot of a lot of little imperfections like this that you don't get freaked out about. You realize when you realize they're original, and that's what the building had for the past hundred years. Fasteners. We talked about the number of rivets and fasteners. I had spent so much time on fasteners on this project. There's always one aspect of a project that takes 10 times as much time as you think it should. And so much it was fasteners on this one, you know, rivet heads and 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 other things. The in this particular case, um, Charles Wilson must have really loved rivets. But in this particular building, he had many too many of these rivets where he wanted them to show, and they didn't need them. But if he had to attach a piece and it required a rivet where he didn't want to see a rivet, he put a flat, a flat head rivet. A flat head. I didn't even know they existed at the start of them. At the start of them, until I looked at it, I realized, wait a minute. He put a flat head ribbon on because he didn't want to see a ribbon there where it had to be to attach it. And sure enough, that's what he did. So we had to um, we had to spend a lot of time on ribbons, a lot of time on fasteners, uh, and we had to take a lot of steel off. And the problem with taking off steel, taking off ribbon and steel, is that. If you, the quickest way to do it is you take a torch and you torch off the ribbon head, right? And then they get the piece off. But it destroys the piece that you're taking off in the process. So if you want to, you want to reuse 
a piece like that that has rivets on it, but you have to take the rivets off. You have to use a big chisel called a hell doll. That's the truth. Called a hell doll that uh, requires lots of compressed air and massive forearms. In our particular project, um, there was a guy named Tony who nobody got along with. And they always put him in charge of doing the, removing the rivet heads. And so he worked by himself off on the water side when everybody else was doing something else. So, he, so they didn't have to deal with it, right? And um, one day I took my son, my young son, down to, uh, to see the building, to see what's going on. And we got down to the, we got to the, I walked underneath the building to the water side and scouting in there. And I heard this, boom, 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 boom. ding, boom, 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 as the rivet head, you know. I broke him down, I broke him down the scaffold. And so I yelled, Hey, Tony, I'm coming up and stop work for a second. He said, Okay, I won't do it. And so when we walked up the scaffold and we the top, and Tony was in the process of cutting rivets off every five inches from a 250 long, 250 foot long angle that we had to disassemble without destroying it, without, right? And I said, we got to the top, I said, I said, hey, this is Tony. I said, he's got to remove all the rivets from this angle all the way across the face of the building. And Tony looked at my son and he said, yeah, stay in school. <laughs> <laughs> so, my son still tells that story. Yeah, stay in school. All right, so I learned a lot about these fasteners. And what do you think? Just take a little guess. With one of those sucker stops where we had to actually turn a, a rivet, turn a new rivet with a thread on it so it could be bolted together, but it looked like a rivet from the face. And not quite as much as a salad at Sweet Green, but still <laughs> seven bucks, seven bucks for one of these. And we needed quite a few. So I learned a lot about fasteners on the project. How, how do you hold that in place? It's, it's true. No, that's the problem. And it's not like if we if we were working with anything that was low in the building, we had to use these. If we were working with anything that was up high, we used an A45, one of those torque fasteners that that where you you put it in place and you torque it from the rear face, and when it gets to a certain tightness or torque, it sh shears off. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Um, I won't go back to it, but there's there was one in, in the in the soffits. We use those in the soffits because from from 40 feet away they look like rivets, and and these were used down below when we were taking pieces, and they were at eye level or up 15 feet. We had to use them. So again, um, these are real rivets that are then stuck through and then and then uh, and then simply welded from the rear face. Everything was tagged, everything was numbered, and it drove everyone crazy. But that was the only way to get it to fit again. Try to imagine the amount of, of there was so much paper on this project. And all the clips were stainless steel, were galvanized, and all the fasteners for the exterior facing were stainless steel. But can you imagine? just figuring out where everything went, keeping everything separate, tagging it. Boop. And that's the paper. The paper, this is really, this was the most daunting thing because we had that 50, we had that 50 page schedule, but they had to, they had to translate that into work. They had to put those numbers into a, into a work schedule. And that was not easy. There was just so much paper. Now, I thought every building, every building that you work on is going to have a surprise for you, something just completely blindsided about. Um, this building here, this is under the loggia. You see these, this, we thought this was all cast iron. Look at this here. These look like all cast iron. In fact, the frames are cast iron. And uh, we figured everything here, we knew what everything was. We, in fact, had looked, one of the things we did was to look at the, was to look at the construction drawing, construction photography, 
to get an understanding of how things have been put together, the sequencing and construction, things like that. So we look, went back to the historic photos to say, okay, they did this first. They did before they did this, and this is the way it went together. That's good. Yeah, now I understand. Well, let's go back to this for a second. And also, every job has something you can learn about another material you, you, you don't think about it when you bid the project, but all of a sudden you say, hey, wait a minute, I got a lost to be on a wall here. And it's because of the substance of the corn column on the north side, it's cracked. There's about five feet of it that needs to be reconstructed. Whoa, what do I do about that? And I was, so I learned something about Boston And I, then I got to work with Boston Craftsman at that time, which was really interesting. The other thing was that I got one of my funniest times. I took a um, Columbia field trip <laughs> class to, up to the top of the Boston wall. I got them there. And I, I don't have the photo, I'm sorry. It was too dark. I didn't have a flash. And I said to them, I said, now, I said, you're standing on top of two and a half inches of unreinforced masonry in the face of my... And I took the photo, but I didn't have a flash. Anyway, so I figured we knew exactly what this was and how it, was and how it went together. But one day, I was looking at, the, looking at some paint on the front loader, and I said, Jesus, what the hell is that? So I had the guy remove some paint, and it turns out that these pilasters or the, the frames that I showed you were in fact cast iron, but they had a slot in them and they had slipped through glazed ceramic tile into the slot. And so we had to use a completely different paint removal method. We couldn't aerobrasively clean this here. And that meant we had to use a different paint system for the outside of the cast iron because we couldn't blast it without damaging, without damaging the tile. So there's always something on every project that's going to that's going to challenge you and surprise you. Okay, these are the guys in the Bronx that did the the, the pre-assembly for all the, the cast iron and the steel. All right, these guys had a, a shop in the South Bronx and uh, historical arts and castings and uh, Robinson Iron and Allen Architectural Metals would uh, ship the stuff to them, to this yard here. Doesn't look too impressive, does it? Well, we do good work. <laughs> and they would ship this, they ship the materials that had been partially assembled, but still small enough to put onto a flatbed to the Bronx. And, uh, and then they would, pre they would assemble it for installation. So pieces like this, well, let me go to the next one, would be taken and would be assembled into the installation assembly on a cradle like this so that they could then move it down to Manhattan on a Sunday, right? And then ultimately, let me go for this one, ultimately then crane it on a Sunday to the building and, re and install it. So I'm going to go back for a moment here. So I had to go, I was always finding myself going from the pre-assembly plant in the Bronx to the installation in the battery. You know where that title comes from now, right? <laughs> and so uh, when I would spend a day, I would often be up in the Bronx and then go to the battery first because I would be watching, making sure they did something the way I wanted it up in the Bronx and then watching the installation of another piece that had already been delivered down to the battery. So at some point I said, wait a minute, the Bronx is up and the battery is down. And, I, and, I, and, and that's why I used it as the title. Okay, so what have we talked about? Paint. Oh, Jesus, paint. This was an incredible effort at polychromy. And so I hired an old friend of mine, Matt Mosca, who came up and spent four days in a lift um, and on the scaffold taking samples before any of the pieces were removed, right? And um, at one point, at one point, it was pretty amazing. Uh, at one point I said to him, I, I, I was looking at his schedule for the underside of the, um, the underside of the, 
uh, of the arches beneath the Wasabino. And I said, Matt, I said, they must have picked out some of this in, in a different color. And he said, well, Piper, you can do what you want, but what I put there is what it was. <laughs> and he, he really he took samples of just about everything. So ultimately, we did exactly what he said. They said when they did the Cipriani work, they changed some of the some of the trim colors because they didn't like them. But uh, I don't know how they got away with it, but they did. So it was pretty amazing, pretty amazing when you consider what it looked like initially. And then, and, and what it looks like now, on the, especially on the water side, which was so dramatic. One big thing that people always ask me about when they see these photos, they said, Piper, I don't understand. Why did you do everything up above first and do the base at the, at the end? And that's because the bases had cracked because of the weight of the pieces above them and the substance of the pieces above them putting pressure on the cast iron. So we had to develop a new structural system to support everything above. And everything was down here, weight bearing at all, the board's own weight, right? But so we could do that at the very end. In fact, we had so much work to get done at the top, and we had a new structure to support it that we didn't need those pieces on the bottom. So it wasn't as if we were building from the bottom up. We were building from the top down to a point where we could put the pieces on and they would be not endangered by the weight of the pieces above it. There's the structure. And that structure didn't exist, and that's the reason all that cast iron cracked at the bottom and fell into the river. And then little Mr. Pace, one of these big copper assemblies was stolen from the site, so we had to replicate it. Most of these are actually original and just cleaned. Uh, and uh, if you go, if you take the ferry to Governor's Island. You will note that some of the tiles, the one on the right-hand panel, are completely new, but some of the tiles in the other panels are new as well. We couldn't match them exactly, but that's all copper and glazed ceramic tile. One thing I urge you to do when you start any large cast iron project is establish a glossary up front. So we had numbers for everything, but when you got the guys working in the field, they're not going to say that these pieces are A16. These pieces, the guys in the field says, hey, Piper, we're missing three Twinkies <laughs> on, the, on box number three. And you, where, where were those three? And, 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 and then and we also got a donut. We need to get a donut. So, um, uh, anyway, so establish a glossary, an informal glossary. Yes, the numbering system is important, but the uh, but the glossary will come in handy with the guys when you're talking about certain things in the field. Um, there's actually one of these pieces in the cabinet in the lab that somewhere uh, that is zinc thermal sprayed and, un and, and not painted, and it's uh, a reject that we use to test the finish. Anyway. Okay, the Bronx is up and the battery's down. And I spent a lot of time, you know how long it takes to go by public transportation from the <laughs> to, to the battery? They didn't have Uber stack then, guys. They didn't have Ubers. All right, anyway, thank you for listening. You know what, nobody wants to ask these questions. Let's just go eat some. <laughs> And you can ask questions while we're eating. <laughs> we can certainly do that. Um, uh, if, if that's what you'd rather do. Whatever. But if, does anybody have questions that can't wait until they have food in front of them? <laughs> I think that's a smart decision. <laughs> well, then, so, yes. Wonderful. Thank you, Piper. This was really terrific. It's so impressive. Just one quick question. How long did it take you from start to Yes. yes. <laughs> From the, yeah, that's a good question. It took actually six years from the first from the first um, contract. We had in, in a year and a half of that was scaffolding erection on the water side, and uh, fabrication took a long time. Uh, so it took it took six years, and um, 
And that was that was basically an incomplete job, in effect. Okay, we didn't do we didn't do any interior course. We didn't do the top floor, which has become Casa Cipriani's uh, hotel rooms. Uh, we didn't do anything in the waiting room. You know, um, it was basically just an exterior restoration, and that was plenty. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, thanks again. Let's go. Right. Let's go and get some food. All right. Are you all joining us for food? All right. Yeah. 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 Super. Yeah.